I'm going to talk about synthetic life, uh, which some of you may think doesn't really belong in medicine. But I think if you open your minds and let your imaginations run wild, you'll see it may be uh, all of our future. I've spent the last 20 years of my life digitizing biology. And basically, my version of digitizing biology has been reading the genetic code. So as we convert this DNA molecule, which is, I like you to think about it as an analog software device. As we read that genetic code, we convert it into the ones and zeros in the computer. And that's how it gets digitized. And that's, in fact, how we analyze it and interpret it. And, and so that started in a big way for us in 1995 when we read the first genetic code of a living species. It expanded five years later to, in fact, do the first version of the human genome almost 10 years ago now. A few years back, the first complete version of the human genome. I've been told I did this modestly. I sequenced my own genome. And this is where our first understanding of genetic variation really started to take place. Because we found instead of being uh, different in one of 1,000 letters in the genetic code, we differ by 1 to 3%. Uh, I, I was very relieved by these numbers because it meant we weren't all essentially identical clones. And when you look at the degree of human variation and, and all the genes that it's in, it's really a very high number. Also, with the Sorcerer Expedition that some of you heard about, we've been sampling around the world. And to date now, there's roughly 21 million genes that have been discovered by all of science. Over 20 million of those came from the deck of my sailboat, uh, just taking samples in the oceans around the world. And so we've more than doubled the number of genes three times. But this is early on in our process of discovering life on our own planet. Uh, even the 200 trillion bacteria that all of you have associated with your bodies are part of this new uh, gene repertoire. But I'd like you to think of genes in a very different way than you may have thought about them before. I want you to think about them as design components. So if we're going to take over and start designing life, we have, unlike the electronics industry that only had a few dozen design components, resistors and capacitors and transistors, and then integrated circuits, right now we have 20 million design components. Pretty soon we could have 100 million as this gene discovery keeps increasing uh, on the planet. So we started asking questions of whether we could pare life down to its most basic components. In 1995, we actually sequenced two genomes. Uh, we sequenced also uh, this small cell that has the smallest genome of any self-replicating organism. It only has uh, around 500 genes in total. And being a basic scientist, we were able to ask some very simple questions. If, if one species needed 1,800 genes, another 5,000, and this one needed only 500, was there a smaller subset that we could get to to really define the basic elements of life, really the, the basic operating system. T to spare you 15 years of research, we basically decided to answer these questions, how many were essential. We had to synthetically make the chromosome so we could vary the gene content. And that simple idea was the start of this whole new field uh, we now call uh, synthetic genomics. As soon as we decided to go this way, as every th decision you make, there's now a lot of new questions. Can the technology even allow us to make really big pieces of DNA? Could we reconstruct uh, cellular chromosomes? And if DNA is really like software, how do we boot it up? Is it just, do we make uh, large molecules and they're interesting molecules? Or are they really the software of life? And are they the basis of life? So we sent out to answer those. Uh, we started first with a small virus, an important historic one. Uh, Phyx-174 is a bacteriophage. It kills E. coli, the bacteria. It was actually the first viral genome that Fred Sanger and his colleagues sequenced in 1977. And so we thought, historically, it was worth trying to make that as our first synthetic uh, molecule. It only has 5,000 letters in its genetic code. Uh, but it took us over a decade to make those accurately because the process of DNA synthesis is not very accurate. So when we start with a digital code in the computer and four bottles of chemicals, we have to try and build the chromosome. And the DNA synthesizers that do this are not extremely accurate. So in this study uh, a few years back, we developed all these new methods for correcting the errors. 
So we started with the digital code, four bottles of chemicals, and we made this 5,000 uh, base pair long genome. And the exciting phase came, we injected it in the bacteria E. coli, and the E. coli cellular machinery recognized it as normal DNA, started making the proteins from it. The proteins self-assembled and made the virus. And so we call this the software building its own hardware. All we have to do with living systems is design new software, and it will automatically build the hardware of, in this case, the virus uh, or the cell. Now our goal was not to make a small virus, it was to make a whole bacterial chromosome. Uh, so the, the smallest genome is about 600,000 letters of genetic code versus a 5,000 base pair virus. So we thought we could at least make these viral sized pieces accurately and then assemble those uh, together in a systematic fashion. And we started down the road of making these smaller pieces and then bigger ones, it was kind of like a basketball playoff. But once we got over 100,000 letters of genetic code, we ran into some major roadblocks. Uh, basically, the workhorse of molecular biologists is the bacteria E. coli. That's how we replicate DNA and grow up large amounts of it. It didn't like these really large pieces. So we started looking around for a new system, and we'd been studying this organism that can take three million rads of radiation. Uh, don't try that at home. We can only take a tiny fraction of that uh, and uh, survive. But this organism's genome just gets blown apart into these tiny pieces. But 12 to 24 hours later, it reassembles its DNA exactly as it was before, and the cell can start replicating again. Turns out we have lots of species on our planet that have these kind of tools. It was a big surprise. And one of the most interesting ones is simple brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we found we could use its system for repairing and assembling DNA uh, to deal with these large pieces. So these quarter molecules that we synthesized of a, roughly 175,000 letters of genetic code, we found if we just threw them into yeast, designing them so they overlapped each other, and we made what differs between the eukaryotes, which we are, and bacteria, which are prokaryotes, is the nucleus, but also eukaryotic chromosomes have a thing called a centromere. When you look at pictures of chromosomes, they're Y-shaped, and it's that little thing in the center that's actually a centromere. We made an artificial centromere, and we immediately were able to just assemble this chromosome from the bacteria in yeast. So for the first time, we had the complete synthetic chromosome. This is the largest molecule of a defined structure ever made by humans by a very substantial margin. In fact, this just puts it in size comparison to the kinds of things that had been done before. But it was completely made from four bottles of chemicals. Now, we wanted to see, for simplifying this, could we make smaller pieces and throw the smaller pieces in yeast? So we took the 25 smaller subsets of the genome, just threw them in yeast, and yeast again reassembled this to make the entire synthetic chromosome for us. So now we have a very powerful tool uh, that instead of taking 10 to 15 years to make a single molecule, uh, it takes a day once we have the subcomponents. This now allows us, to, in fact, to make a robot, potentially, to make millions a day. So how do you boot up a piece of synthetic DNA? This was actually the harder part uh, in the end. And this study that we published a few years back, I think is one of the most important ones of my career, and it, and it still seems like science fiction to a lot of people. So in this study, we took a chromosome from one cell, put it in another cell, replacing what was in there, and converted one species into another. Uh, it sounds like a, maybe genomic alchemy. Uh, but what we did is we isolated a chromosome from one bacterial species. We added a few genes to it so we could select for it, and it would turn cells bright blue if it got activated in those cells, and inserted it into a related species. But we have a very sophisticated uh, cartoon here to show you what we think happened, because it's even more interesting when you look at it. So we inserted this new chromosome into the cell, and like the viral DNA, uh, the cell machinery started reading this genetic code and making the proteins. These things just happen. But some of the proteins that got made immediately are these molecular scissors. So my colleague in all this work is Hamilton Smith, 
who got the Nobel Prize in 1978 for discovering restriction enzymes. These are the molecular scissors that cut DNA at very precise points. These started getting made. They recognized the original chromosome in the cell as foreign DNA and chewed it up. So now we have one species with another species chromosome in it. That's the only difference. In a very short period of time, we ended up with these bright blue cells. And as we measured their proteins, their lipids, every characteristic of these species, all the characteristics of the first species completely disappeared. And the cell now was what was coded for by the new software that we put in it. This is not what people thought historically would happen with life. Everybody thought there was this vitalism, this special essence that has to be added on top of the complex material. Uh, but it is the software of life uh, that does it. So now we had a problem, though, because we were assembling the synthetic genome in a eukaryote, and somehow we had to get it out of the yeast and move it back into a bacterial cell. So to practice this with regular genomes, we learned how actually to convert bacterial chromosomes into eukaryotic chromosomes. And we've been able to actually grow these bacterial chromosomes in yeast just becoming uh, artificial eukaryotic chromosomes. And we do that just simply by adding a synthetic centromere. So now the yeast thinks it's just like their own uh, DNA. But a major problem was we tried to take this DNA now out of yeast and transplant it back to form another bacteria. And no matter what we did, it didn't work. So this is a problem that took 20 of us uh, two years to solve. Uh, but to make a very long story short, uh, in fact, just two weeks ago, uh, we published the results of this in the journal Science. We found that the DNA has to be modified. And what happened in the original cell is that the DNA was methylated to protect it from its own restriction enzymes. So restriction enzymes in bacteria are like our immune system. That's how cells protect themselves from foreign DNA. But so that their own enzymes don't destroy their own DNA, they methylate the sites that the enzymes would attack. So we found if we took these same enzymes from the cell and methylated the chromosome in yeast, all of a sudden we could transplant it. And to prove this, we eliminated the genes in the cell that we're transplanting into uh, that coded for the restriction enzymes. Then we could use just naked DNA. So this is now a very dramatic circle. We can move DNA. We can move software across the branches of life. But even more importantly, the reason there's not been a whole lot of success with working with bacteria is bacteria, for the most part, don't have what's called genetic systems. You can't modify their DNA very easily. But an amazing thing happens when we convert a bacterial chromosome into a eukaryotic chromosome. All of a sudden, it, it opens up the whole world of eukaryotic genetics. All the things that allow us to modify chromosomes easily in yeast, now we can apply to the bacteria. So we add this yeast centromere, we convert that bacterial chromosome into a eukaryotic chromosome, and now we can make lots of instant rapid changes in that genetic code. We can change genes, we can swap things in and out, and then we can take that DNA, methylate it, and transplant it back into a recipient bacteria. It destroys the DNA that was there, and we create whole new cells from this. And we can do this over and over again, and it changes dramatically uh, the entire field of what could potentially happen uh, in molecular biology. Now, we haven't done this yet with the synthetic chromosome. We're in the process of doing it. We think we've solved the final hurdles. Uh, I've said to many reporters, I think it's still possible we will have the first species powered by a synthetic chromosome this year. But then I remind everybody that I've said that for the last two years. Uh, so uh, it's a prediction that may not come true, uh, but it will very soon. At Synthetic Genomics, we're actually using this tool. We now have software in the computer for designing new software of life. And so we can build new DNA molecules to do what we want them to do. And we're applying this to a variety of things, new species to create energy, the program we have with Exxon, another program with BP for metabolizing coal. 
But in the medicine field, if you use your imaginations, it's essentially unlimited. Working uh, uh, with this combination that we have of being able to rapidly synthesize large chromosomes, you can make cells and screen them for making any pharmaceutical molecule. When we screen the oceans, all these organisms in the oceans, they make far more complex chemicals than our best chemists on the planet can. They use these chemicals as uh, their chemical warfare against each other. Probably tens of thousands of new antibacterial and antivirals out there uh, that we could make just from these kind of processes. Uh, we've had some nice success with this uh, in terms of vaccines. In phase three clinical trials, using this process of analyzing the genetic code and writing small pieces of DNA, we have a new vaccine against meningitis. Uh, this is work that started with Chiron, and then Chiron was purchased by Novartis. Uh, and this is in phase three in children uh, in Europe right now. Uh, and it's an exciting new vaccine because it's the first new one that really works against all types of uh, meningitis B. And as you know, this is a disease uh, that by the time it's diagnosed, uh, young uh, uh, boys and girls, uh, men and women, die from it. So this is the early stages. We can actually write the genetic code. We think we can uh, uh, build a whole new vaccine program, and we're doing this with Novartis and others, to take on changes in the genetic code with viruses, designing things that change rapidly. These are just some of the possibilities that come from now this new power we have to actually write the genetic code and create new life forms. It's an exciting era and one where I tell people uh, we're limited only by our imaginations. We've had ethical reviews from the beginning. We have this ongoing as a part of an ongoing discussion. This is an exciting new area that has implications for everything. A study out of England, out of the Royal Academy of Engineering, said this new field will probably be the number one method of wealth generation for individuals and countries uh, for the next century. Thank you very much.